Welcome to Just Relationships, the show that offers you concrete ways to make your relationships better. Whether it's your boss, your spouse, your children, or your friends, the quality of your relationships in life directly affects how you feel about yourself and the success you achieve. Your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer, a psychotherapist, telecoach, author, and seminar leader, will interview top experts to help you learn to manage this essential part of your life. And now, here's your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer. Greetings to you. Welcome back to part two of Relationship Therapy with Alicia Munoz, who is a triple author. You Hopefully you heard her last week and, and you have come back for part two. And her books are No More Fighting, 20 Minutes a Week to a Stronger Relationship, the Couples Quiz Book, How You Have 350, oh, I'm, we took uh, a little uh, vacation time, not 365. You, get, you gave people 15 days off, Alicia. <laughs> That's very nice of you. Uh, <laughs> and the funny, the wonderful thing about the quiz book is that you're, you're being asked questions of your partner as well as yourself. So it's kind of like the newlywed game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, do you win or, or lose? And then a year of us, one question a day to spark fun and meaningful conversations. And um, I do want to talk to you about the value of play and uh, being curious about your partner. I um, Before we do that, though, first of all, last week I opened with explaining about Imago Relationship Therapy since we, are, we met in studying it. We are colleagues. Um, so um, Imago Relationship Therapy, and if you would be so kind as to explain your version of it. Yeah. So Imago Relationship Therapy is really about recognizing the larger context of your attraction. The theory behind the word imago, it comes from the Latin word image. And Harville Hendricks uh, used that word because we're often drawn to people who, who are sort of similar in their psychological dynamics as early caregivers. So basically, that means that we're often attracted to people who have both the positive and negative traits of our early caregivers, and with an emphasis on the negative. So what I mean by this is that initially, in Imago, uh, when you're drawn to somebody, you think, oh, they're so amazing. So you see all the fabulous traits. You see that they're kind. You see that they're thoughtful. You see that they're considerate that they're funny, smart, similar to either or both your mother and father. Then once you move through the romantic phase of attraction, the negative qualities start to surface and you see that they uh, cough in a certain way that you don't like, that they have a tendency to be aggressive uh, like your father or mother, or that they might show signs of laziness like one of your parents, or they might not listen to you the way your mother or father didn't listen to you or your caregiver. So Imago really is about understanding the, the foundation of our attraction for people uh, because so many of us are entirely puzzled by the fact that this person that we fell in love with who seems so wonderful uh, six months later seems so terrible. And Imago really explains why that is and how that happens and how you can use that as an opportunity for growth and for evolution into being a mature adult. Mm, Beautiful, beautiful. And this, you explained it so beautifully, Alicia. And, um, how people, maybe there are people who heard this information for the first time that you just explained. Because I used to be in the field of domestic violence mm-hmm. and um, giving lectures. And I had a speakers bureau and uh, trained uh, speakers in not only public speaking, but in domestic violence and um 
when you when you see how there is such incredible hatred mm-hmm. that people experience toward their intimates say mm-hmm. how you know that so many murders are are yeah. from intimates you say how is this possible mm-hmm. i fell in love with this person i vowed to love them so um yeah and so just to understand that dynamic so now i get the dynamic i went to Alicia Munoz, and she explained this Amago relationship theory. And now I know that I subconsciously chose my mate because they are similar to my early caregivers. Okay. And then what? Yeah. And then if you're uh, doing Amago therapy, you learn some basic communication tools, one of which is the Amago dialogue. And in this tool, as you know, Duffy, because we learned it together, um, you are learning how to engage in something called mirroring, which is essentially reflective listening, which just means that when your partner speaks and they are in the speaker role and you are in the listener role, you paraphrase back, you repeat back what you hear them saying, uh, and then you learn to validate them where you make sense of their logic and you tell them what you're saying makes sense. Uh, Even if you don't agree with your partner, you learn how to put yourself in their shoes and see the world through their logic and their perspective. And then you practice and learn the final step of empathy, which is really uh, heart centered and really about um, imagining your partner's emotions and feelings So this dialogue is one tool that teaches you how to slow down your reactivity and develop more empathy and and also simultaneously help your partner heal. Yeah, and and that's what Harville Hendricks and Helen Hunt talk about, the creators of Imago Relationship Therapy, that they contend that we shouldn't, we shouldn't divorce our partners when we have these incredible conflicts because they are so similar in negative ways to our early caregivers um, that unless that person is so recalcitrant and so incorrigible and so refusing to budge in any way, I mean, literally incorrigible, that practically no amount of therapy can help. And that, unfortunately, there are some people like that. But as we talked about in the last show, uh, this technique of positive flooding, where people have not heard uh, a lot of positive affirmations about themselves, and then they hear it from their partner in a concentrated form, and they can open and soften and uh, be more willing to look at it. And also, I just want to, in case people didn't hear last week's show, um, how people are more willing uh, to change eventually if you're not asking them to change, you're not pressuring them to change, you're keeping the focus on yourself and you're asking the question, how can I be a better partner, number one? And number two, what do I want? Mm -hmm. And then we also start people with looking at their their relationship vision, Mm -hmm. right? What kind of relationship do I want? What kind do you want? And isn't it something, lo and behold, right, how that relationship vision often matches? Yeah, because often we tend to, um, well, I think that most of us have a tendency, and in my clinical experience, partners also have this tendency to know what they don't want. So a lot of times we know, well, I don't want to fight, and I don't want stress, and I don't want problems, and I don't want to feel lonely. Knowing, Knowing and naming what you do want is the first step toward attracting and getting and accomplishing and creating what you do want. You know, um, it, it's, it's sort of like you wouldn't talk about, well, what kind of a house do you want? You wouldn't talk about all the houses that you don't want or what, where do you want to travel? You wouldn't talk about all the places where you don't want to travel. Um, But in relationships, we do exactly that. And that affects our ability 
to achieve the joy, the peace, the connection, the passion that we want in our lives. Yes, and I'm also trained as a gestalt a psychotherapist, and we look at what's called the contact cycle, that people are, we're all motivated to, to get our needs met. And I have to give certain diagnoses for insurance purposes, but basically um, the gestalt diagnosis is simply any interruption of that contact cycle. And the contact cycle starts with contact with yourself, that I get to know what my needs are. I, I have a, I know a naturally healthy person knows what they need. If I'm thirsty, I know I need water. And, and then to galvanize their energy toward that, to, to get it, but also to be satisfied by it. Not just to say, well, I know I want to be with people. Okay, I'll say yes to that party because I want to be with people and connect. But I feel so, I have social anxiety at the party, so I'm not really enjoying it. So when we actually have the need met to let it in, and so many couples, uh, when they experience positives from their partners, they don't even let them in because they're so guarded against any threat from history yeah. and then and then we have a rest and digest part then we said ah oh, beautiful satiation got that need met okay what's next what's next so what I find with people is that when I ask them what they do want they so many people have been trained to not get what they want to not ask for what they want to not assert themselves like the whole thing about, uh, you know, children should be seen and not heard. And, and that's, still, that's still happening. Not as much, of course, as historically, but in certain subcultures more so than others. But so if people have to start with what they don't want, okay, spill it out, ventilate it. You don't want, you don't want. Okay, now let's look at the opposite of all these things. So if I don't want constant fighting, what do I want? Yeah. Yeah. To start there. So, but I, I, I couldn't agree more with the idea of when couples will say to each other, you know, I really want you to stop doing this and this and this. And of course, the other partner completely cringes and closes up. Well, what, what, how do you want them to be? So, yeah, yeah. You have that kind of patience with people as well. What's your take on that? Well, I, I'm, I'm listening to that cycle that you described and thinking about how, what a useful and simple framework that is for understanding uh, a really productive way of thinking about sort of need fulfillment, right? Is yes. knowing your need, uh, expressing your need and, and then digesting and taking in when that need gets fulfilled, even if it's just 10%, if it's 20%, 60 right. taking in, um, and then I was also thinking about what you said uh, about when we're thirsty, we mm-hmm. know to, to, we know to read that in our body as right. thirst, you know, and then to kind of go and fulfill that need for thirst. And of course, emotional psychological needs are are so much more complicated, and they're influenced yes. by by patterns that get set into motion early in our in our relationships with our caregivers when we had to adapt ourselves to be the way our caretakers wanted us to be in order to stay connected to them. And so often I think what happens in couples, at least some of the time is that we're not necessarily in touch with our psychological thirst. Mm -hmm. However, we do want our partner to read our minds or to Mm intuit or know what we need, even when we ourselves are not fully embracing what we need. And that is a very frustrating cycle to be in. And, uh, and often that can follow with the, with the failure of the rest and digest portion of the cycle, where even when that, you know, our partner br- maybe miraculously brings us a cup of water, let's say, if we're going to go with the thirst metaphor, Mm-hmm. Um, we, we say the water doesn't taste good. It's, it's mm-hmm. not full. 
Uh, why did you drink water? I wanted lemonade. And mm. you know, so, so it's, it, it is really important to, to look at and understand what you don't want, as you say, as a starting point to mm-hmm. make to clear that out, to make space, to connect with what you do want and learn how to express it without necessarily uh, feeling shame for expressing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to tolerate the form your partner gives it to you in, whether it's perfect or imperfect, you know, to, to take it in when your partner gives you some, some percentage of what you want. Yes. Hence, hence that no one person can fill all our needs and nobody is perfect. And in the literature, we, you know, we talk about the good enough mother, more so the good enough mother than the good enough father. For some reason, that term doesn't come in because there is so much more uh, cultural pressure to be a certain way, the role of mother for, for a woman. Um, but I think that is so important. And to tolerate the, if you get 10%, you know, like I say to my clients, it's, it's, uh, you got closer. Mm-hmm. So in the incremental learning mm-hmm. and how many people, and when I go into the corporate world with human relations and winning as a team to managers, the same thing you want, you want someone to be here higher up and then they get here and you say, nah, 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 not good enough. Versus every incremental piece needs to be positively reinforced and noticed and seen. And all studies on motivation indicate that when people know that they're seen and watched, they, they tend to achieve higher, higher performance. Mm-hmm. So, you know, these are things that are in psychology 101, you know, positive, negative reinforcement. And, and yet, so many people don't think in those terms. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think our culture is to blame in part. I know Esther Perel writes about this a lot, um, that you know, their modern marriage is burdened with so many expectations that 100 years ago, 200 years ago, I'm not saying it was necessarily better then in terms of yeah. all kinds of cultural problems and, and blind spots. And, um, but it, but there was, there was, it was the needs of our needs were spread across a community, right? Religious, uh, you know, friends, family members right now, it's really, there's, there's this expectation that our mate is going to fulfill every single one of our needs. They're going to be our best friend. They're going to be the most amazing lover. They're going to be our co you know, CEO, they're going to be our co the parent, the co-parent to our children. Uh, they're, they're going to be our advisor, our therapist. So, so many needs get put on partners and relationships. And uh, I read this quote once by David Rico, who is an author and psychotherapist. And he said, this could have shocked me, but he said that we really should only expect our partner to fulfill 25% of our needs. And um, I liked that because inside myself, I realized that I have more of a kind of 80% expectation of my spouse, like he should fulfill 80% of my needs. And, and so the thought of, wow, I could really, that's a lot of slack there. You know, if, if I mm. can take in the, you know, if I can kind of not, not even lower my expectations, but be realistic about what any one individual can do for my personal satisfaction and life fulfillment. Maybe what I need to do is cultivate more friendships, you know, d- dig into community, uh, find a stronger sense of purpose rather than piling all of those needs onto my partner. Absolutely. Alicia Munoz, you are in great company because David Rico is also a guest on Just Relationships. He has been on our show several times. I love him. And, uh, you know, his book, uh, How to Be an Adult, is that cool? Mm -hmm. And then second book, How to Be an Adult in Relationships. And then he goes on to How to Be uh, Spiritually uh, Centered. Uh, So it's, (laughs) so you see, 
You're a colleague of David Rico. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, such a, that's such a thrill. Yes, yes. So um, we have just a few minutes left, and um, there's so much. There's so much that we've talked about in t- uh, this show and last week's show. So the idea of imago, the word from the Latin, from the Greek, similar, it's um, most people are shocked. You know, when I talk to them about that, they're just shocked. And they say, oh, no, 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 not at all. I don't see it. I don't see it. And then I usually preface uh, with, um, I know this is going to sound like a silly question, but who might your partner be more like, your mother or your father? And not everybody has an active mother or father. I find that, of course, their their family history first. But, um, oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, because you're talking about uh, something that's unconscious, really. Yes, yes, yes. You're you're inviting your clients to take a kind of dilate the lens through which they view their romance and their attraction and their love uh, to kind of a bigger perspective uh, that that takes into account their unconscious and. And that, uh, you know, that's not something we normally tend to do until things get super hard and painful, and then we're willing to do it more. Yes. And I I will say, short of um, severe, continuous domestic violence, um, that I I do think that a couple, really, I'm going to use the word should, you know, should not get divorced until they at least try marital therapy. Yeah. especially when there are children involved. My goodness, how many people are so prideful? You know, we live in a society, last week I mentioned the term toxic masculinity. We live in a society of toxic individualism. Mm-hmm. So we are taught as Americans that we have to know it all, do it all, get it right. And if we say we need help outside of our relationship, it's, it's, it's awful. It's, it's an asthma. It's the worst thing in the world. So there's so much here. I, I hope that, that our listeners are really giving themselves a break in terms of understanding the complexity of self-awareness and then the complexity of relationship awareness uh, uh, relational intelligence, social intelligence, emotional intelligence, what we are up against, because we are hardwired mm-hmm. to go into fight or, f- or flight or freeze. We are hardwired, mm-hmm. but we have this new brain, this neocortex, this um, ability to think, to imagine, to reason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. So what? Yeah, what? Yeah. What say you uh, to to our audience by way of closing? Um, what do you want people to know, to remember, to keep in mind? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that that it's really key to um, to to kind of reframe how you think about love and uh, and to really look at it more as a, 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 um, a vision quest, a journey of self-discovery of joint self-discovery between you and your partner uh, and less of like a, a place to arrive and stop. Um, but really to, to recognize that it's a process that's flowing and unfolding and it's definitely going to have difficult moments in it. And like you said, short of, of danger or safety threats in your relationship, um, conflicts and differences and challenges can, can actually be reframed as, uh, as opportunities to grow. And, And I see it as being smart, selfish, uh, being, Staying in your marriage and using it as a tool for growth isn't some sort of of uh, martyrdom or self sacrifice. It's actually 
a way of, of, of growing yourself to be more fulfilled, more mature, more capable of complex empathy. So, um, you know, you're, you're serving yourself by learning to be in a two person system rather than just a one person system. Yes. And if you think about two people, uh, two bodies with one head, and sometimes you can go your different ways and uh, have your own life, but sometimes you have to go to some place together, you know, like we talked about it, a vacation, you know, and how do, how do you do that? You're in some ways a joint organism in that regard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. So, yeah, that's... So you, so you have yeah. the capacity to, uh, to kind of be under one... Uh, I think the idea of having my husband's head just freaked me out. So I'm going to have to come up with. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you need a different I, head you know, two heads <laughs> under one umbrella. Yes, two heads under one. Um, okay, I like that. Two heads. <laughs> under, I'll take it. By the way, if you ever get a chance to read the story of the Siamese twins, I I read their their uh, biography. Mm-hmm. How they managed to take turns. They each had a wife. They, they were attached in body, but they each had a wife. And the other was dormant when they were in their, their brother's bed, who was a salient husband at the time. Fascinating story. Yeah, I love that. So I don't know if you want that metaphor, Alicia, but, <laughs> but I'll tell you, it was fascinating. All right. So Alicia Munoz author, multi, multi author, no more fighting 20 minutes a a week to a stronger relationship, the couple's quiz book and a year of us one question a day to spark fun and meaningful conversations. And we can get this anywhere. And I guess you have a website in case people uh, would like your psychotherapy. Yeah, I, I, I do. I'm uh, only working virtually right now and uh, I'm not really taking new clients, but people can always go to my website to read my blog. They can find me on Instagram. I'm always posting advice and tips there. Beautiful. And also, if anyone would like to get in touch with me, Dr. Duffy Spencer at Gmail. Dr. Duffy Spencer at Gmail. Alicia, it has been such a pleasure talking with you these past two weeks. Mm. You're beautiful, just beautiful. Thank you very, very much. So welcome. It's been so fun to connect with you. Thank you. Thank you. This is Dr. Duffy Spencer wishing you great relationships. <laughs>